All right, please welcome my colleague, Wendy Prober. So thank you for being here, those of you in my Music 111 class and some other guests. Uh, this is, today is uh, Wednesday, April 19th, 2023. This is the lecture demo portion of the, um, of the day. And then there will be a second video uh, later that, that includes the entire concert. So what Wendy and I are gonna uh, do for you is play a few examples, or play some um, excerpts from the opening song in the piece, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about it before we perform it. This is a piece, as you can see this uh, image on the, on the screen, this was an image from an um, art, it, well, an exhibit in a museum in Dusseldorf in 1938. And they used this image very specifically because it relates to a composition by the composer Ernst Krennic, you see one of the names up there, who wrote a piece called Johnny spielt auf, which means sort of Johnny strikes up or strikes up the band. And it's a story about an African-American jazz musician who's sort of subversive and goes against the grain, and the music is jazzy, as Wendy will, will play for you a little bit. And as a result, it became sort of the, no pun intended, the poster child for degenerate, or entartete Kunst, uh, degenerate art, or in this case, degenerate music, entartete music. So it became sort of the poster child for it. So this image was very deliberately chosen with these derogatory and racial stereotypes and the playing a saxophone and so on. And this art exhibit, or this, this exhibit of this music, um, in, a, in a rather beautifully ironic way, uh, this music during the 1930, leading into the, 19, in the 1930s was banned. It was not allowed to be played on the radio. Jazz was not heard by a lot of people, but of course, jazz was very popular. People liked it. You think of that movie, Swing Kids, if you've ever seen that movie about young people living in, in Germany in that time period, and they would create these subversive dance hall clubs where they would listen to this music. And so people wanted to listen to this music, but they couldn't. And the wonderfully ironic thing was they, would go, they many people flocked to this exhibit so that they could hear the music, because they couldn't hear it anywhere else. So I thought that was a, that's sort of an amazing um, sort of bit of info that people were like, well, I want to hear this stuff. Let's go, to, let's pretend that we don't like it, but let's go so we can hear music. And as you see, it's too, it's related to the One Book, One College program at, at Valley College and classes on campus are reading this book, Mouse by Art Spiegelman. All right, so um, maybe we'll start by, I'll let Wendy take over a little bit, maybe talk about her part and what she hears in the music and what you can listen to, and then I'll, I'll add in a little bit about my part. So this is a piano um, arrangement of excerpts from the opera by Krennic, and uh, it's, you, you don't get to hear some of the fabulous orchestrations, like he used saxophones and he used some of these more popular um, instruments, but it's this little excerpt that we're gonna play um, is entitled Blues, but it really is kind of a German impression of blues. It's got some of the blues-ish chords in it, but you wouldn't recognize it as like a 12 bar blues. Um, but it is this kind of impressionistic, um, what's, what was kind of what was going around in the air, in the water. Uh, Kurt Weill um, was doing this kind of music, kind of cabaret feeling uh, music. So this is one little excerpt from the Credit Opera. Yeah, and, and I, hear, I hear in this music, uh, a, a fair amount of humor, but dark humor, and it sort of relates to the piece. And so um, my interpretation, which you will see, um, I, and I'm also, it's sort of a singer's trick because you'll notice that Wendy has quite a long piano introduction before I start singing. And uh, Audrey, our other singer today, Audrey Yoder, who's gratefully with us today, can probably attest to the fact that one of the hardest things for a singer to deal with is, what do I do when I don't start singing yet? <laughs> the music has started. <laughs> like, what do I do with my hands? What do I, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, right? So I felt, I felt sort of the urge to fill the space a little bit, and hearing the humor in it, um, sort of this is, this is my take on it. And I have no idea. What and she has no idea, because I told her about this, but I haven't.
sort of jagged, can you listen to those jagged rhythms, those dotted rhythms? Um, or maybe play them straight, and then we can listen to that and then play them uh, jagged. Uh, like, uh, like classical music, um, and so on, right? So that was uh, my interpretation. I'm, I'm, I'm happy if Wendy's a, a, at least in agreement with it. She's not going to say that she's not in front of you. But, um, because I wanted to show that sort of sense of, you know, coming up and being ready to do a performance, and then, oh my god, I made a mistake. I, you know, you weren't supposed to start yet. That sort of thing. So that's where it came from. But one of, one of the things, the reason why there was a list of all of the, 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 the traits of music that were on the degenerate list, um, Igor Stravinsky was his own list. He yeah, yeah. got his own number. Um, but one of the one of the components was jazz and blues, and because they said that it was it was Negro music, and so that made it bad, and that was the, that was the racial element, which is right. why there's that. So and anything and any music that was influenced by African American music was considered. Degenerate, and so there was. There's a lot of jazz influences in this opera, which was wildly popular, hugely popular um, when it came out. And there's in the in the concert that we'll be playing um, in a few minutes. There's another piece that I'm going to do that's also a blues. How it just was trickling, you know. That was just what was in the air. And all of these composers, whether or not they were American or Europeans that were just influenced and they loved American yeah. jazz and American blues and that was forbidden. And quite literally in the air. So it was the advent of radio, which was becoming super popular, of course, where people could now hear this music in their homes 
and get access to it much more than they had before. So that was also disturbing to the Third Reich because they were afraid people would listen to this. And, and jazz and swing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it made you move. That kind of music made people move. They wanted to dance to it. And that, that also was thought of as degenerate. That was too crass or too bass uh, to want to mu move to music. So that was another reason why it was sort of banned. And, and Krennic was not Jewish, but everyone thought he was. <laughs> and, and, and so he was kind of on the banned music list, even though he right. wasn't Jewish. He right. Wasn't. So that was another interesting element of it, that, that composers were banned for, as Wendy said, for very, very other very reasons. Writing atonal music that was ugly or too modern sounding, or, or even if music uh, borrowed too much from the past, they didn't like that either, right? Mendelssohn, who we heard last week, um, uh, was you know not not living at that time period, of course, but his music was banned also because, in some cases, they felt that he was borrowing too much from before from the past. His reverence for Bach, for example, was was not forward looking, where the party in power wanted people to be more forward looking. But then you couldn't be too forward looking. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And that irony also of like, well, people say, well, what is it that makes music sound German? Well, Maria, who was here last week, remember, we talked about the Haydn piece and the sound of the Alpen horns that have that sort of quality to it. And you could argue, oh, that sounds like German music, but it's hard to pin down. And of course, that was one of the things about it that was so ridiculous was they said, well, the music doesn't sound German enough. It was like, well, define that for us. Well, you know, you, you know it when you hear it. Or if it's not there, you know it's not. So kind of ridiculous. But anyway, I wanted to point out in the, in the last few minutes here before we will take a break in the concert, and, let, and I see if Wendy has other, other things to say. There are flyers here with this QR code. Um, for those of you here for the first time, you can scan this and get the entire concert series. And on, and on that concert series, on that list, there's a link to degenerate music with a lot of resources on it video clips, links to video clips and articles and so on. So if this is a topic that you have some interest in, you may want to dig a little bit deeper. And we put up some uh, links on the different composers and on the, the, this whole issue, if you're interested. So please take a look at that and share it with your friends. All right. Well, one of the things that you know, we're talking about, like what is music, what is German enough, is that the Jewish composers, they struggled with this within um, Within, the, within German society because they said that they were not, they were German, they were not German, they were Jewish. And this is something that actually I, I didn't really understand, but Germany, we have this concept of Germany as a, as a country, which didn't really exist until the middle of the 19th century, the late 19th century. And there was the German people, there was the nation, and there's a difference between a nation and state. And so there were different nations, the, the, the people, the German people, there was Bavaria and Prussia and all of these different nations of, Jewish, of, of German people. But there was not a state until later. And so the Jews, even though they lived in Germany, they were not considered Germans either. They were their own nation. They were a Jewish, a Hebrew nation. And so when Germany became a state, everything got all kind of confused and all of a sudden they had to create what is German. And the Jews, the Jewish composers got excluded from that. And so they were always struggling as to where did they fit in. If they tried to be too German or if they weren't German enough, and it was a constant, a constant struggle. Yeah, and they, and they faced all kinds of problems. Like for instance, Franz Lehár, who was a, very popular operetta composer, uh, or I mean, you could say opera composer too, um, had a librettist, so in the, in the opera, from those in my class remember, the opera, the, the composer is the person who writes the music, and the librettist is the per person who writes the words of the story. His librettist, whose name is, I'm slipping my mind, was Jewish. So, but Lehar's music was highly revered by the Nazi regime. So they were in this big quandary. What do we do? We love this music, but we don't like that. Yeah. So all these all these levels that went to it. So is there anything else in, in the, co the concert today, music-wise, that we wanted to point out? Um, 
Well, for the concert, we put together a, concert, a program of, um, Christian asked me to do a concert of composers that were less well known. Not, not Mendelssohn and, and not Mahler. Um, kind of, and, and I dug really deep and I had a lot of, a lot of fun um, finding things. But it, we're playing pieces by some composers that are virtually unknown because they never got a chance actually to live. Um, one of the pieces that I'll be playing is by a, a young man named Dick Kattenberg. He wrote this piece when he was in 1940. Um, he was uh, 20, 21 years old, and he was killed in 1944 in Auschwitz. And so it's really the, the work of a young person your age who never got a chance. Um, we don't know what the what the career, what the, the life work of that man would have been. Um, that's the Kattenberg. There's another composer, and that's from Holland. I wanted to choose composers that were not just German or not just Austrian. So we've got Austrian composers, we've got Dutch composers, and one of the last piece that we'll be playing on with violin and piano is by a composer again I was not familiar with, named Geza Fried, who was Hungarian, and he fled uh, Hungary in 1927 because of the rise of the fascist regime there. He fled to the Netherlands, which he thought would be safe. Mm -hmm. And um, then in, when, when um, Hitler invited in, in, invaded the Netherlands, he had to go underground. And this is a story of someone who actually survived. I wanted to show there were some people that survived. He went underground, he thrived, um, playing. He worked as a forger of documents. And uh, he also played underground. But after the after the war, he emerged as one of the, uh, the strongest voices in Dutch music. And so this is a piece that uh, he wrote in 1955. And so the one of the the great tragedies from a cultural standpoint is that when you have you you had really just an emptying destruction of culture, the destruction of music uh, in, in Germany, in Austria, in all of Europe, all of these Jewish composers who were killed or who had to go into exile, and some were able to work, some became janitors, um, that there's, there's a cliff in terms of, of music in, in Europe that just stops. There's continuation of composers and teachers who would then teach their students and um, so on and so on that is stopped. And so as I was doing, I've been doing all of this research, there are composers that I've never heard of that were extremely popular in Germany and Austria, but because their legacy didn't continue through their students and through their performances, we don't know about them. So that's Part of the reason we're trying to resurrect this music now. Okay, so we're, we're going to break for about five, maybe ten minutes to let other people come in. Uh, for those of you in my music appreciation class, make sure if you're not going to stay for the concert, make sure you sign out, get credit for the discussion today. Um, and then I'll be putting out other sign-up sheets for those of you in the One Book, One College program that you can sign later on. So we'll see you in a in a. In a yeah. Thank you. 